Hello everybody, I'm Mike Peters from The Alarm. This is Life Minute TV. They hit the U.S. scene in the early 80s. Mike Peters and his alarm opening for the likes of Bob Dylan and U2. 17 top 50 UK singles and more than 6 million album sales later, they're back with a new full-length album called Boards, which could not be more appropriately titled. It was written by Peters from his hospital room bed while suffering from a life-threatening bout of pneumonia and a relapse of leukemia, which was first diagnosed in 2005. And it's 10 beautiful high-energy tracks that Alarm fans have been waiting for. We could not be more excited to welcome Peters to the Life Minute studios recently to hear all about it. This is a Life Minute with Mike Peters. Mike Peters in the house. Yay! Hey. <laughs> oh, thanks so much for coming. We're yeah. thrilled to have you here. Great to be here. Fantastic. Can't believe it, really, after all I've been through in the last year. So oh, good I to know. be alive and good to be talking. How are you feeling? Yeah, really good, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm the benefit, a beneficiary of all the breakthroughs that science has given to allow people like myself to survive and live with cancer for a long time. And I've probably had more chemotherapy than most people on the planet. <laughs> And uh, I'm still here to tell the story, so I'm very grateful to be alive. Oh, we're grateful too, and you look fantastic. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we'll try to stay fit. You know, when I was in the hospital, uh, I was diagnosed in 2022 with pneumonia, and my leukemia went out of control, and I was in the hospital. So in between all the IV sessions, I just thought, I've got to keep moving. I've got to maintain my body strength. So I used to do a lot of walking in the corridors of the hospital at night. It was quite a lonely place to be because there was a lot of post-pandemic protocols in place so there was no visitors so I almost had the hospital to myself just to walk through the corridors at night and started thinking about new music and that's what kept me going. Aww. You're <laughs> such a beautiful person you radiate your smile smiling like this <laughs> talking about this. I asked my mum asked my really and uh, you know I brought up with great parents uh, not alive anymore but they, they they gave me the courage to go out and find my own happiness that was always all we want for you Mike is to be happy in life and know that if it doesn't work out we're always going to be here for you they never forced me to do anything they were just quietly encouraging and although I didn't think they kind of thought rock and roll that was maybe pushing it a bit too far <laughs> <laughs> not that happy but <laughs> tell us about the new record yeah I've got a brand new album called forwards coming out on June the 16th 2023 uh, we're going to be playing in New York City on the 23rd and 24th of June, so we've got a big, big month coming up in June. Um, we're really excited about the new record. Uh, we have really positive reaction from it already. We've dropped four singles on, across the internet, and they've all been received really, really well. And the fans are very excited about this record. We've played some of the songs live back in the UK on a couple of the shows that we've done, some big shows. And so, yeah, we're really excited about the future, and and what Fords is going to bring to the, the Alarm Music Songbook. A lot of the album was written while I was in hospital, so there was a lot of background noise. I was on a ward with other patients, and you hear all the bleeps and the noises of the heart monitor, and I knew I was in hospital for a long time, so I had my guitar brought into hospital, and the nurses were cool with that, and I was only playing it quietly just to keep my fingers going. And then the other patients across the ward were going, hey, play, play a bit louder, you know, they were really enjoying it. And, uh, and then all of a sudden new music started to appear w without even me thinking about it. I wasn't, never sat down to write a song, they just appeared. It was like I'd been gifted these songs and, uh, and I, I wanted them to be positive because unfortunately when you're in hospital nowadays, we live in such a litigious society that it's very hard for nurses and doctors to give you hope in case it's false hope and the, the treatment doesn't work like they hope it's going to be and then someone maybe turns that into a negative. So they just give you the facts. So I think you have to generate your own optimism, especially in a hospital where there's no visiting because it was the pandemic at the time or post-pandemic, but protocols in place. So the, the, re the record really reflects me wanting to get out of hospital. I, I, was, well, I was in there for so long, I couldn't imagine what it was going to be like to get home. So I thought, when I do get home, I got, it's going to be like this. And I wrote a song called Next, and, and it's really upbeat. and, and 
There was one incident in the hospital when, in one of the rare visiting times, there was, there was another man sort of hovering near my bed, and I was thinking, like, he was kind of looking at me, you know, that look, and he, he went, it's Mike Peters from the alarm, isn't it? I went, yeah, okay, yeah. And, he's a, and he was American. And he asked, oh, wow, what, what, what are you doing? He said, well, I got in yesterday and you, were, you, were, you didn't look well yesterday. You were, you were having the treatment and you were, and I didn't want to disturb you, but it's my father's just on the same ward, just a few beds along. And uh, I've, I thought he wasn't going to make it, so I've come home to say goodbye. And, and he goes, but I told all the alarm fans last night, I'm on the forums that you're in the hospital in the cancer centre. I was thinking, oh no, the story's getting out, what am I going to do? And so I had to go online and, and sort of write a reassuring letter to the, all the fans, say, yeah, okay, I'm in the cancer centre, and I'm like, this is what's going on, but we're going to make it through, I'm going to give it my best shot. And, and I signed the, the notification off, I said, forwards, Bike Peters. And I thought, as soon as I wrote the word down, I thought, that's the album oh. title, and that, that's going to be the song. The next minute, the song appears in my imagination, and, and I, I always, people ask me what, how you write songs, and I think, they're all written in the imagination, just like you can hear your favourite song right now. And then the, the guitar becomes more like the midwife to bring it out into the world, or the piano, whatever instrument you've got, that just bring, draws it out of, your, out of your imagination into reality. How old were you when you started? Uh, well, I, really it started when we were a band called The Toilets, <laughs> uh, and that was in 1977, and uh, I was 17. And I'd just seen the Sex Pistols play and The Clash, and, and I thought, right, we've got to start a band. And uh, we thought, let's come up with a name that will shock everyone. And we came up with the, the name The Toilets. And uh, we exploded into life. We were a good band, um, and we had good songs at the time. And we played with The Clash. And then we went to London, to the Roxy Club. And the only thing we didn't have was, was anyone to help us channel the energy. And, and so the, the energy, dissipated as time went by and then we, we became another band called Seventeen and eventually we, we got experiences to learn how to channel our energy in the right way. In 1980 we got a break and went on tour with the Stray Cats from Long Island in, here in New York um, and they were an electric band and we just saw, it was a bit of an education to see them and uh, we were all together when John Lennon was assassinated and uh, we actually played in Liverpool the night after his death and, and we, went, we had to all walk to the venue which is on the same street where the Cavern Club used to be and all the flowers were on the, laid out over the cobbled streets and, and I remember thinking, wow, our band has just become about fame, we're just trying to get a record deal and it has to be about the music, it can't be about anything else other than that so we decided to start again, a fresh start, and, and we were going to be called The Alarm, and we we're going to have original songs, and if our music only get us to the garage, that would be enough. But if it took us all the way to Wembley Stadium, like it did, mm -hmm. then we'll, we, can take, we can live with that as well. Why is it called The Alarm? <laughs> well, uh, when, when we had our punk band in 77, I, the first song I wrote for it that was original was called Alarm Alarm, and we had a conversation around the table to look for a name of the band. And, uh, and I said, oh, the first song I wrote was called Alarm Alarm, and we went, oh, that made a good title for the band. So we wrote to the legendary DJ in, in Britain on the BBC, his name was John Peel. And we wrote to him and we said, we're changing the name from 17 and we, we're going to be called Alarm Alarm. And he, he read our letter out on the BBC, we couldn't believe it. And, uh, and he said, uh, there's a few of these bands now with double barrel names, it's Duran yeah. Duran. <laughs> Yeah. Talk, talk, and now we've got Alarm, Alarm. He goes, I'm thinking of changing my name to John Peel, John Peel. <laughs> and I went to the band, we're called The Alarm from now on, okay? And so that's how we got our name. Very oh, cool. <laughs> and um, Bono calls you the second greatest rock band of all time, I believe <laughs> yes. it was. Yeah, one of his uh, many apt descriptions for The Alarm. We played with you two. The first time I met Bono was, was 1981, December 1981. It was the last night of their October album tour and they were about to go away and make the third album and I, I can remember setting up my amps on the stage and uh, and then there was a tap on my shoulder and it, I looked around it was Bono and he, he was like what's this you know he's intrigued by my acoustic guitar because alarm acoustic guitars have electric guitar pickups in and they've got volume pots they can crank the volume up and that's what makes our sound different and he was really intrigued he liked the fact that I had a harmonica and, and he said, look, I, I don't know how to play guitar, 
I said, well, I'll show you a few chords. He said, right, come back to the hotel tonight and we'll, do, we'll have a session. And so I ended up back at the Portobello Hotel and taught him how to play Knocking on Heaven's Door by Bob Dylan. And, and he was so grateful. And, and, and they went off to do the war album. And as soon as they came back out the studio and they was talking and playing shows, they said, we want the alarm to come on the tour with us. And so we did. And then they came here to the USA. And, and again, their, their success started really happening then. And they, they invited us to do the last 20 dates of the war tour in America. And we were reasonably known in Britain, but only at a club underground sort of level. So when we came to America, we'd never been on TV or never really been on the radio. And we were driving into San Francisco for our first concert with you two at the San Francisco Civic. And we heard Bono and the Edge on, on the radio. And, the, and the, at the end of the interview, they said, do you mind not playing New Year's Day? We want to play this record by this band that are playing with us tonight. They're from Wales. They're called The Alarm, and this is their song, and it's called The Stand. And we were like, wow, we couldn't hear it. On. We were, hadn't even done a gig in America. We were on the radio. And it was, you know, and Bono were, and the Edge were our first sort of promoters, if you like. And it was, it was amazing. And, and then we ended up doing our first television shows in America. We did The Cutting Edge on MTV and, and the American Bandstand. We couldn't believe it. And then when, when we actually, we went back home to Britain and recorded a song called 68 Guns, came straight back to America and released it in the UK as a stopgap. And um, amazingly, it went into the UK chart and we had to go on top of the pop. We flew back home to Britain to do the TV show. And the presenter just said, here they are. They, Two days ago, they were on tour in America. Here they are on t television, and this is their song, 68 Guns, It's the Alarm. By the time it was broadcast, we were back in America <laughs> and got home again a couple of weeks later. And I remember walking down the street in London and all these fans come mobbing me in the street. And I've never had a, never been mobbed before. It was like, wow. And, th and they, they were asking for autographs. And I said, where'd you come from? What's your name? They said, you don't sound American. I, was, I couldn't work out why they thought we sounded American. And, we eventually got home and we had a party. My mum had a party for us to celebrate all the success that we were having. And my dad had got one of those massive video recorders. And he said, look, here it is. And he, he'd recorded Top of the Pops and he played it back to us. And we, we How cool. couldn't believe it. And then we saw the, the presenter say, they've been on tour in America. Here they are from the USA, the alarm. We thought, no wonder everyone thinks we're American. <laughs> but we're from, really from Wales. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys played with Bob Dylan too, didn't you? Yeah, we did a tour with Bob Dylan in 1988. And uh, it was intriguing because he'd obviously taken his name from a Welsh poet, Dylan Thomas. And uh, he knew a lot about Welsh poetry. And, and we kind of got to know him a little bit, as much as you can say you get to know Bob Dylan. He's, he's a very private man. But it, we, we were playing a, a, a tour where he was doing multiple nights. So Bob Dylan, you might not believe this, but he didn't like staying in fancy hotels. He, he liked staying in hotels that didn't have air conditioning because he didn't like, didn't like the air conditioning. <laughs> so we ended up staying, because we were part of the entourage, we ended up staying in the same hotels. And a lot of them were these, we thought, quite crummy motels on the edge of towns with an outdoor swimming pool. And he liked swimming in the, in the pools. And, and so that's how I got to know him. It was in the swimming pool in between these shows. And um, one, one day he, he didn't show up for swimming and his, his assistant was a guy called Victor Malmoods who'd been with him since the Don't Look Back days in the Greenwich Village days and he was his friend and I said to, to Victor, Where, where's Bob today? And he said, oh, he's got a bit of a cold, he's going to stay in his room to get ready for the show tonight. I thought, great. Next day, Bob's in the pool. I said, hey Bob, how, how, how are you doing? How, how's, the, how's the cold? And he went, what? I said, oh, Victor said you had a cold and you weren't feeling well. Victor said, what? And it, and, it, and it was like, next minute, Victor was banned from the tour <laughs> as <out>. punishment <laughs> for, for a few weeks because Bob didn't want anything uh. private being leaked at all. So that's the kind of person he was. But, but he used to come on the alarm sound check sometimes if he was early in the show or if he was arriving at the show early, he'd come and stand on the side of the stage. We were doing a song on the tour called Bells of Rumney uh, by the poet Idris Davis that had been set to music by Pete Seeger, which is all Bob Dylan era. And he, he loved hearing us singing there about all the Welsh towns. And, uh, and then he invited me on stage to sing with him a couple of nights. Cool. And that was an amazing experience to, 
be on the microphone, you know, cheek to cheek with Bob Dylan. I mean, still can't believe it happened, <laughs> even now. Yeah, not a lot of people do that or could say that. Well, I, I, I'm really lucky to, I'm, you know, and luckily, uh, there were, obviously at Bob Dylan shows, there's no cameras, no, no one's allowed to film anything. But um, on the night he invited me up to stage with him, I gave him a camera to uh, his son, um, Jesse Dylan, and so he was allowed to take photographs. So he he captured the mo the only capture of that moment is from from Bob Dylan's son <laughs> using the alarms camera. <laughs> Um, do you find like the fans are receptive to the new stuff too and like they request the old stuff as well yeah, and you I play both? Alarm fans have always been receptive to new music because that's been our focus. We've never stopped making new music and the fans, they, they get as excited about that. Uh, the challenge came out when we got to our 40th anniversary, which was just recently. I was thinking, how can we honour that and still play some new songs as well and as well as all our history. So we came up with this idea of doing a a medley of songs, of, of alarm songs. So we, we came up with a, a closing part of the set, which lasted for 55 minutes and featured something like 26 alarm songs from right across the history. And uh, it was amazing. It, it liberated a lot of the songs in, in a way because it was just all the essential ingredients. So it was one after the another, another you know, there's no time to stop. It's just bang, we raced through all these songs. The fans are with us all the way and it created a, a huge momentum in the show. And it allowed us to still play some of the deep cuts and some songs from the history in the first part of the set. So I think our set list was something like 36 songs. You know, as most bands, it's about 18 or 19. They get in a, an hour and a half or an hour and ni uh, 90 minutes sort of show. And, I, and so we were cramming a lot in and it was, it was fantastic. So it's a great time to be an alarm fan right now because there's a lot of music in the set when they come to the shows. Did you always know you wanted to be a musician? No, I think I wanted to be a footballer or a journalist or something like that at first. And so much so that I even took, um, I took typing in school <laughs> uh, so I could bit have all those skills. And uh, I, was, I was into computers as well. The first time it got introduced to the British curriculum, I took a, uh, it was called an O-level at the time and I passed. And uh, I went to university to do A-level computers. Um, and it shows you how t different the times are now went to the university and I was the only person on the course. <laughs> and so they stopped that after a month and uh, because they couldn't afford to run the course to teach one person. Yeah. And then my mum spotted an advert for a local supermarket chain called Quicksave that needed a computer operator. I went for the interview. They couldn't believe I had an exam in computers and they just hired me on the spot and, and uh, you know, I was, and I was into that and then I saw the Sex Pistols thought, right, <laughs> computers, let's get the guitar out and learn to be a rock and roller. Well, how, did, were you self-taught? Yeah, absolutely self-taught. Yeah, I used to learn from putting records down on my player and figuring out the chords. Somebody gave me, uh, when I was a young lad, somebody gave me a Beatles songbook and, and a load of Beatles records. And at the time, in, the, in that point in the 70s, probably 74, 75, the, the Beatles had been and gone. They, were, they weren't around like they are now. It, it was like they'd broken up and you were into Wings or John Lennon, but the Beatles stuff wasn't, it wasn't on the radio. It, it was only just been a hit recently. So I, I discovered the Beatles quite a lot through playing the White Album and, and I had the songbooks. So I could learn the songs and, and there was the ballad of John and Yoko. That was one of the ones I learnt first because it stayed on C for ages. And I get my fingers in a position, put the needle down on the record, and I could play along with it for about 30 seconds before it changed chords. Oh, no, I can't get to the next chord. But eventually you keep persevering and the next chord. Amazing. You, you really learn how to get there. It's amazing how it just comes, you know. Yeah, it's a, exactly the whole thing. The Gathering, are you still doing that? Yeah, oh, well, we, we've just had our 30th anniversary of The Gathering. And uh, the gathering is a, a it's a concert role reversal really, where uh, when I was first became really ill and I couldn't travel because I've been living with cancer since 1995, uh, we started the gathering as a way of bringing the fans to me. So I, I thought I can't go to them anymore. So you do the travelling, they do the hotels and the trains and the planes, and I'll stay at home and put the biggest concert on that they could they could hope for. And, with, and, and so it became this totally immersive weekend with our best fans from all over the world coming to our hometown 
And because I wasn't doing the traveling, I could put a lot into the sets that we played. So we play a lot of music. Um, and we got to know the fans really well through it because we'd hang out with them off stage as well as on stage because we were together for a long time, for a whole weekend, four or five days. And, and it became a, a learning ground. You know, and it became, uh, the pressure was on when it happened every year. And it, and it became, right, we've got to have something new for this year. We've got to have something to share. We've got to be able to keep moving it on. And it's really been the impetus behind lots of our records that we made over the years. Uh, we've, we've been able to draw on the, the experience of what the fans like listening to and that feed that into the creative process. Um, we started a charity called Love, Hope, Strength in 2007 and we were able to launch that at the gathering and invite people to come on the, the hikes with us and, and that became an extension of the gathering. And it became a, a way of us all walking together, not just in terms of music, but putting something back into the world as well. Oh, that's so beautiful. What, what does music do for people? I think it, it lifts them when they really need it most. I think sometimes you get more from music than you from photographs or videos. I think music takes you to a, a great moment in your life when you've had an experience or, or if it's a brand new song and a lyric comes out from it that, that captures what you're going through. I think it's, uh, it can really give you so much that normal life maybe can't quite put into perspective for you. I think sometimes you can be really down on something and something terrible's happened and then you get in the car and a song comes on the radio, it just happens to be the right song in the right moment. And it just puts you, right, everything is gonna be all right, you know, and, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's really important. It's, I think music nowadays is, it's gone more into the background. You know, when I was a kid growing up, your speakers were the most thing you had in your bedroom were the speakers. Now they're on the floor in the background and there's screens on the wall and that yeah, takes yeah. precedence. But the music is still all, always there. And, and I think it's, you know, nowadays, I think the great thing about music is a song from 1983, The Stand, and recently it becomes like a modern song because it appears in, in the film, in a, in a TV series. And then all of a sudden you've got people using apps like Shazam and who's this, you know, bang, and they, they discover the alarm. And it brings us a whole new audience. And uh, we, we had the stand appeared in the, the Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why. And, and as soon as it hit, it, it played at a penultimate moment in the storyline. And the next minute, there's three million followers for the alarm wow. that we didn't have the day before. Wow. And, and that's, that's all because of music. It connects people. And in that, in that regard, digital isn't so bad. I didn't think of it like that. No, know? I think, like, I think it's you helpful. Know, uh, Look, I'm a vinyl guy, but I still like the digital thing. And, and if that's all you've ever grown up with, that's, it's, still, it's amazing that you've got access to that amount of music. And as long as it takes you beyond the classics and the, the omnipresent yeah, songs, right, and you, can, right. but you can definitely, you know, we see it all the time with people connecting with the alarms music, because we've got a following all around the world and there's always someone playing an alarm song somewhere in the world. And that means someone's walking by listening to it or it's they're, they're sharing the music with their friends in a car or their new workmates and hey i went to this band the alarm bang there's a song you got to listen to and we music uh digital music connects us to new fans all the time are there any musicians that you think are particularly good that you like to listen to nowadays or i'm into everything you know i i like a band from ireland called the fontaines dc they're really cool and uh, there's a band called The Lathams from the UK that you might not have heard of yet, but they've got some great songs. And uh, I, I just, uh, I like listening to all kinds of music. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, recently I've been a big fan of Northern Soul music from the UK, which is massive in the 70s. It was underground black soul music that never really taken off in America. And people would come over to the UK and find these acetates or these unreleased songs and bring them back to the clubs like Wigan Casino and the Torch in Stoke in, in, in the north of England. And they become huge cult records for these fans who'd go to the, because the DJ had the only copy, they'd follow them around and dance to this music. And I, I loved that time about music when it was unattainable in, in some ways. When, when you used to buy records, you go to the shop, you couldn't play it immediately, you know. It wasn't something you could download on your phone and start listening to you. You had to carry it home and yeah, you'd be on the yeah. bus and the train reading the yes, sleeve notes. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, one of the big 
motivation for me getting into music was I, I loved a band called Slade and I went to buy my first ever LP and it was called Slade Alive and I, and I looked at the cover and I flipped it over and read the back and it had all the song titles and one of them said Born to be Wild and in brackets it said Steppenwolf and I thought oh I don't want a record by Steppenwolf I only want Slade and there was another one that had Be Home Darling Be Home Soon Sebastian I thought well I don't want that and then there's in from a shot like my gun and it was Slade. I thought, oh, well, that, that, there's only a few Slade songs on this. So I saw an album by David Bowie and I liked Driving Saturday. So I bought that instead. And when I got home, I played it and, and I was reading it, the sleeve notes. And I saw that he had a song called Let's Spend the Night Together. And in the sleeve notes, it had in brackets, Jagger Richards. And I thought, that's the Rolling Stones. So I thought, I want to be one of those guys. I want. I wanted to be one of those guys with the name in the brackets, you know. So I went back and bought the Slade album because I realised that that it was all Slade. But these are the songwriters, and that's that's what I really wanted to be in life. Well, you're really eclectic too, you know. And you can hear that in your music. Yeah, look, I've got a wide range of, and uh, nothing's off the chart, you know. I, I live in a house with a 16 year old and a 19 year old, and one's into all the Brit pop and Oasis and the Stone Roses, and one likes all the modern sort of clubby grime sort of music or he likes Lady Gaga or AJ Tracy and all these other bands or artists I think they're more artists now than, than bands in a way you know they keep me up to date with what's going on and uh, I, you know I like being challenged by the music of, of the day because I think there's always a place for music to you know there's only the, a certain amount of notes but there's an infinite set of possibilities within them What's next? What's something what's that next? you're going to do you haven't done yet? What, what I haven't, what's next that I haven't done yet? Well, climbing the Alps in September is one of the things I'm going to be doing. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Because we, we, our charity, Love, Hope, Strength, is really about um, showing people that y there is life after cancer and that you can have hope and strength through it. And, you know, you might not get your whole life, but you might get some of it. And that e even the five minutes is worth it. If, if you're, you can stand up to the disease long enough to be able to tell your wife you love her one more time or, or speak to your kids or hang on till your parents get to see it. Or, or you, life is beautiful, whether it's for a minute or for a year or for eternity, and it's worth fighting for. And, and that, that's what we try to portray through our treks through Love, Hope, Strength. We climb to extreme parts of the world. We get, we, We've been to Everest, Kilimanjaro, we've done the highest gigs in the world on these places. Take some amazing musicians on the treks. Uh, when I was ill in hospital, my wife Jules took 50 people to the Moroccan desert, to the Sahara, and raised 100,000 pound. And we, when, whenever we go to a, a place, we leave the money indigenously there. So when we did Everest, we, we, the money was going to the Back to Ball Cancer Center in, in, Dar in, um, in Kathmandu. As soon as the Sherpa found out that we were raising money for their community, for their kids or their family, they couldn't do enough for us. And we had the most amazing experience on the mountain. Same when we went to Kilimanjaro. And we, we, with the money we raised in Kilimanjaro, if we brought it back to the US or the UK, yeah, it's a drop in the ocean, but keeping it in Africa, it went, it was a huge amount of change could be created. And we, we ended up building a children's cancer center in Dar es Salaam. And, uh, and which we still support now. And, and we, uh, all our adventures, like we're going to the Alps, and that's gonna be some of the money we raise will we'll help support the cancer centers we've su supported around the world. Um, I'll be speaking at the, the Cancer Leaders Summit in California in October. I've already spoken at the World Cancer Congress in Melbourne, Australia. And who'd have thought that we'd be able to join the forces of music and, and with, with what I do to, to stand up to cancer. And uh, it, that's been a, an amazing journey. And, and, and uh, when I spoke at the Cancer Congress, I think they weren't quite expecting a rock and roller to pop up <laughs> and, and give his speech, but also finish off with a song and have them all clapping and dancing in the aisles. And, uh, and I think that's what, what it is now. We, people like myself who represent that new face of cancer where there is hope and there is, uh, there is a chance. Of every, everyone has a fighting chance now against cancer. Beautiful. That's amazing. I love it. And you're going to play for us too. I right? am, yeah. Oh. You get, what song? Do I you don't know, know. what, what you think? Oh, <laughs> do we get to request? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. 
Oh, that's strength. Yeah, that's oh. play strength. Yeah. I think that's even fun. That's that's that was my favorite. So oh, I have great. Goosebumps. But even back then, you were singing about hope and strength. Yeah. Well, that, that's it. When when I was first diagnosed in '95, I, I was on my way to a concert, and I the, the cancer centre didn't exist where I lived, so I just went to normal hospital. There's no clues on the way. My doctor might have known what was going on, but he didn't say anything. And I had a blood test, and my brother was waiting outside. My wife was with me, and the doctor said, "Just come in here for a minute, and we need because we need to talk about cancer." And I was like, it was "Such a shock!" And then I went home with my brother, and he picked up the phone. I said, "Who are you calling?" And he said, "Oh, I'm going to cancel the gig." And I said, "No, that's cancer wins. Then let's go do the gig." And I and I, I didn't know why I did that. It was just an instinctive reaction. And I got on the stage and I sang Strength and I thought, who will be the lifeblood coursing through my veins? And it just hit me like it never, the song had never hit me before. And it, I thought, I wrote this for this reason. Oh That's why. Oh, you're just the embodiment of strength and I love it. People need to hear it. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's great. This is being on Life Minute TV, fantastic. This is life. This is Life Minute. Well, thank you every so minute is precious. Coming. Okay, ready to rock it, yeah? Yeah. Who will light the fire I need to survive? Will be the lifeblood coursing through my veins Like a river flowing that will never change I need someone I can depend on oh, Won't you give me love Give me hope, give me strength, give me someone to live for. Give me love, give me hope, give me strength, give me someone, I need it now. Someone write me a letter I need to know that I'm still alive Someone give me a telephone call Need to hear a human sound Someone open the door And let me out of this place I've been caged up for oh so long I don't know if I'm living or dying Someone better Give me love Give me hope Give me strength Give me someone to live for Give me love Give me hope Give me strength Give me someone I need it To hear more of this interview, visit our podcast, Life Minute TV, on iTunes and all streaming podcast platforms.